And uh, I, just, I, I just pray that nobody loses power and has to sit in the cold. And if you do, call somebody. And maybe there will be an extra bedroom you can, you can, you can be blessed by. Um, so obviously this afternoon is canceled. Uh, we would have a 2, 2 p.m. service usually, and we would observe the Lord's Supper at that time. But we canceled it because oftentimes it goes to about 4 o'clock. And, and later in that afternoon, uh, we're going to experience, it's a good chance we're going to see some of that freezing precipitation. The temperatures are going to start to drop, and it's going to become a little more treacherous. So we decided to cancel the afternoon service this afternoon. We also canceled our missions committee meeting, which you guys probably know. And uh, we're supposed to experience this over, you know, the worst is supposed to be tomorrow and Tuesday, and Tuesday is supposed to warm up, but they're talking about another freeze maybe happening on Wednesday. So just be aware there's a chance we may not have Wednesday services if it's going to be uh, icy and treacherous. Today is uh, Sunday. Isn't it good to be in the church, in church today? Man, I'm really, I didn't know how many was going to be here. I thought it might just be the Simpsons and Brother Hudson. You never know. Because he was going to be here, I knew that. Uh, but it's a blessing to see your faces and, and to see you here ready to worship. Uh, today we're taking a charitable helps offering. And of course that money goes towards uh, helping those in need within and without of our church. Um, uh, when they're going through difficult times, we have Brother Raymond who's head of that, uh, uh, head of that fund. And, and him and the deacons and, and the pastors uh, really work towards helping people. And so if you have means to give towards that, please do that. Um, and also, the last thing I want to share, oh, i got two more things. Next week, Brother Hudson, by the way, next Sunday it's going to be about 60 degrees. So praise the Lord, amen. Be, be Houston again. Uh, <laughs> so, so we're going to have church, no problem. But next, next Sunday afternoon, we expect to have Brother Hudson is going to give a uh, sermon. And it's going to be on the subject of dispensationalism, which is a very tricky and interesting subject, and I'm going to let him do all the explaining about that instead of me trying to fumble over myself trying to explain it. So, uh, But he's going, to, he's going to teach us on that. It should be good. I, and I encourage you to be here. And, um, and then I lastly want to thank you for praying for me. I hate that I was not here Sunday. Boy, I was unhappy. I was the not a happy puppy last week uh, at this time. I wanted to be here and to be preaching the message I'm going to preach this morning, uh, but I've had some stomach stuff, but I'm doing better now. Melissa's got me on a diet, and uh, I've lost a few pounds this week, and I'm not feeling sick like I was, so thank you for your prayers and your kindness. Thank you for Brother Lester being here. Thank you all for being here. Let's stand together, and let's worship. Amen? Enough of my ramblings. Let's, let's worship. Come on, Brother Eric. Lead us. Just thinking two weeks ago, my mom sent me a text with some pictures up in New Jersey. They'd gotten, I think, two foot of snow, and when they were, she sent me, it was still snowing. So it's a little bit of a different uh, situation. But they're a little better situated to address that. So we are going to sing, There is Power in the Blood. If you're in your hymnal, number 191. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power wonder-working power in the precious blood. Would you be whiter, much whiter than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do... There's power in the blood, 
power in the blood would you live daily his praises to sing there's wonderful power in the blood there is power power wonder working power in the blood of the lamb there is power power wonder working power in the precious blood of the lamb amen we're going to move on to give thanks Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ to his Son. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. What the Lord has done for Let the poor say, I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. Give thanks, give thanks, give thanks. Amen. Please remain standing. Amen. I'm going to be reading from my sermon text this morning, Mark chapter 3, 7 through the end of the chapter. My, but Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him, and from Judea, and from Jerusalem, and from Idumea, and from beyond Jordan. And they about Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, when they had heard with, uh, what great things he did, came unto him. And he spake to his disciples that a small ship should wait on him because of the multitude, lest they should throng him. For he had healed many, insomuch that they pressed upon him for to touch him as many as had plagues. And unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. And he straightly charged them that they should not make him known. And he goeth up into a mountain, and calleth unto him whom he would. And they came unto him, and he ordained twelve that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach, and to have power to heal sicknesses, and to cast out devils. And Simon, he surnamed Peter, and James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James, and he surnamed them Boanerges, which is the sons of thunder. And Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him, and they went into an house. And the multitude cometh together again, so that, uh, so that they could not so much as eat bread. And when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said, He is beside himself. And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath the Beelzebub, and by the prince of devils casteth he out devils. And he called unto them, and he called them unto him, and said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand, but hath an end. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme, but he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in the danger 
but is in danger of eternal damnation, because they said he hath an unclean spirit. Then came then his brethren and his mother, and standing without, sent out uh, sent unto him, calling him, and the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren uh, without seek for thee. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked around about them, on them which sat about him, and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. What a powerful text. We're going to unfold this morning. But uh, we're going to take some time uh, to observe offering. We, do, we are still taking offerings, of course. Uh, we're not passing the plate, of course, but we have our boxes and we have online giving. Uh, but we want to have this as a time of worship. Amen? So let's worship. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your word and thankful for this word that we're going to look at this morning. And we just pray uh, for the offerings that we're going to give, that they will be a sweet smelling savor to you. God, we pray for our service, that you'll help us to uh, attend ourselves, Lord, to your word this morning and not to uh, the distractions, not to uh, the stuff outside or the weather or, or any of the other concerns that uh, in, encroach upon our minds. But Lord, help us to give our focus completely to you and to your word. Lord, I pray you be with me. Help me to preach with boldness, full of the Holy Spirit, Lord. And I pray you just use me. Lord, I pray that this message that you've prepared in me is not mine, but that it's yours and that it's for your people. Lord, help us to be changed. Help us to be challenged. And Lord, help us to follow you in all our ways. We love you and we trust you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. skip the third scheduled song. We're going to go directly to uh, the last song, Living for Jesus. Let me ask you all to stand. Uh, if you're in the hymnal, that's number 372. We'll be singing the first and third verses of Living for Jesus.
Please pay special attention to the message of the song. Good morning again. You know, times like these always bring unexpected complications. We don't have children's church or nursery, and so we got my smelly boys in here. Wait, they showered last night. They're not smelly. But it's a blessing that they're here. It really is. And... Um, I want them to hear the preaching of God's word as much as I want to preach it. And um, so if you hear Charlie making noise, just remember he's three. And he helped me during this sermon prep time, okay? He's my sermon prep buddy. And remember he needs to hear it too. Am I okay? All right. Well, we have been in, a, uh, in, the, in the gospel of Mark... 
We've begun to study through the Gospel of Mark, and we're going to go all the way through the book. We may stop a couple of times for some other short series to kind of break it up. But for now, we're holding the course, and we find ourselves this morning in Mark chapter 3 in the text that I read uh, for our morning scripture reading. I read that at that time because it's a long passage, and I'm not, I'm not going to preach verse by verse. There's a lot more to this than every tiny thing that we can squeeze out of this. Uh, there's an overarching picture that Mark is working to define for us. Mark, I, we want to, I want to follow what Mark's intended journey for the reader is, what his intent for us to understand from this text, what his intended uh, journey of understanding is. We've already seen that this gospel is a book of action. We see constantly what Jesus is doing and less about what Jesus is saying. And there's a reason for that. The purpose is Mark has it, wants to show the reader what it truly means to be a follower of Jesus and much about what Mark includes in his gospel is about what it means to be a follower, a true follower, a true disciple of Jesus what that journey looks like, what the costs are. Our first sermon was ready to follow, and the application was count the cost. It's going to cost you something to follow Jesus. And so, uh, and certainly there are eternal blessings that come with it, but those eternal blessings are hard bought. But in our passage today, Mark looks to be trying to nail down specifically who is the disciple. And this whole text, I'll I'll try to frame it a little bit for you. These first um, uh, few verses, I believe it's verses 7 uh, through 12. Verse 7 through 12, it kind of continues from what we saw before, and we will derive some things from that. Then we see uh, him sit, sit, uh, go out into the mountain and pray as to who he's going to ordain as the 12, and then he ordains the 12 and sets them aside, and he's in the house. And uh, he's in the house with his friends and uh, with his disciples. And we see his family show up and his, his people, his, his people from back home have come to get him. They, they see what he's doing. They say, well, he's kind of lost his mind. He's in way over his head. He needs, to hum- he needs to come home and settle down and get back to what's normal. And right in the middle of this, verses 20, uh, verse 22 through, 20, uh, through verse 30, there's kind of a, a break in that dynamic with this, uh, with this family showing up while he's with his disciples, with his apostles. And, and this break, we see the, the Pharisees and the scribes accuse Jesus of having a, uh, uh, the Satan, that Satan is with him. And so there's a little discourse there. And then finally, the story picks up in verse 31, and he concludes, who is truly his followers? who his true family is, who uh, is uh, really uh, following him and what they're they're doing and how that is important. So uh, I I want us to see, though, that Mark does some work to answer this question of who is the disciple. He's doing some work in this passage. He's sharing these stories in this order for a specific purpose, and that is to tell us who is the disciple. First, it seems important, and this is going to be the first thing we see that Mark does, is that he reveals, the first thing is Mark reveals the nature of Jesus' model for ministry in the new kingdom. And this is important for the disciple. It's important for someone who's going to follow Jesus to know what Jesus' model is, what, his, what he plans to do while he's on earth and how he's going to do it. First, we see that the kingdom Jesus establishes is a real kingdom. You know, it's, it's, it's no mistake or, or just coincidence that Jesus chose 12 apostles. He chose 12. Can you think of another place where the number 12 is important? The tribes of Israel, right? There's 12 tribes of Israel, a nation that Jesus has said is his own people, his, his, his own special people. And it had 12 tribes and, it had, and they had a relationship with God, but that relationship had failed. And the covenant that they made with him, that they were trying to hold the line on, had failed. 
They were trying to uphold their own righteousness by the blood of goats and rams, by the observance of the law. And the, the, the Pharisees and the scribes are perfect examples of what this leads to. So Jesus, he prayed and he gathered for himself 12 apostles for a new kingdom, a, a new testament. We saw in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, a new testament in his blood, a new covenant. And it wasn't going to be man trying to hold the line. It was Jesus himself who's going to hold the line. This kingdom that he is establishing is a real kingdom. And it's made up of real people. But it's not a, a, a racial identification. It's a spiritual identification. People who are descended from these 12 apostles, and if you're in here this morning and you've believed in Jesus Christ, your Savior, we are spiritual descendants of these apostles through Jesus Christ, saved in his, uh, by his blood, uh, then we are part of his kingdom. And what we do is, uh, is to bring his kingdom about in our daily life. Second thing we see how he uh, uh, reveals Jesus' models for ministry in the new kingdom we see that God's word speaks from anywhere. Now, uh, what do you mean by that, Darren? Well, we see throughout this book where Jesus goes to the synagogues and, and he preaches in the synagogues and he teaches in the synagogues and he deals with people in the synagogues, but that's not the only place he does it. He does it by the lake. He does it by the Sea of Galilee. He does it uh, from inside homes. He's constantly speaking and teaching Anywhere he is, it's as a day-to-day, daily life thing. We see it in the house of uh, Simon and Andrew, the house in Capernaum here uh, in, chapter, in chapter 2, and then we see him in this house uh, in chapter 3. What that means for us is that God's word is like, for us, is like this for us today. You know, God's word is not only meant to speak to us here in church. Now, this is not the only place you're supposed to come and commune with the Lord. This is not the only place we're supposed to do the Lord's work. Did you know that? God, Jesus' model for ministry is not just in here within these walls. No, it's not limited to the church, but God is often speaking to us, when, if we'll listen, in our normal day-to-day life, especially if we spend time in the Word, especially if we spend enough time in the Word that that Word begins to, to grow within us. I don't mean grow in new understanding or new meaning, but that God's word is part, becomes part of us and it begins to speak into our daily life. Uh, this is what God wants to do. This is where most of your spiritual growth is going to take place, by the way, is not going to be inside the walls of a church. It's going to be outside the walls in your day-to-day life. Most of ministry, most of the most important ministry work is to take place outside the walls of the church. This is the nature of Jesus' model for ministry in this new kingdom. And then we see that the work of God's kingdom often attracts a lot of attention. We see that in those first few verses. So much attention Jesus has been getting. And we see that really from the beginning of chapter 1. He comes in preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and people flock to him. Why? Well, because they see what he can offer them. Healing, uh, help for their present circumstances, and some, very few, for true forgiveness of sin and lasting faith. But it didn't just attract uh, fans. These people, I would, the people who, who are just looking to be healed, I'd call them fans, and we're going to talk about them a little more in depth here in a moment. Not just fans, but it, they also attracted enemies, these scribes and Pharisees. You know, when, when, when there's... The work of God is taking place. We're going to attract some enemies. But also there will be some true followers. So as I said, Mark, Mark is doing some work here to reveal for us this question of who is the disciple. And now we see, number two, who Mark reveals to us who are not disciples. These are the outsiders. Those who, who may be in the crowd, who may be uh, following in some capacity, but they're not the true disciples. Who are these folks? Well, they're the fans. (laughs) 
fans. They're the ones who are thronging to get to him. The ones who are, 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 are trying so hard to get where they can just touch him that there's the danger that he might even be crushed among them, that he has to get into a boat. We see that in these first few verses. And so these are these people who, who, who want to get to him to receive some kind of temporary benefit. If Jesus, you know, Jesus had wanted to be a celebrity, what would he, all he had to do would be? What would that be? All he would have to do is continue to service uh, the, the needs and cater to the crowds. What they wanted, what they needed. But he didn't come to be a celebrity. He came to be a servant and to share and to usher in the kingdom of God. But these fans, they're, they're shallow. They're insincere. They're only seeking help for their temporary infirmities. They want healing. They want help. They want their bank account to be in the black. Whatever he can do for them, they want it. But their, their wants are shallow. And there's a lot of contemporary examples of this, aren't there? There are hundreds, hundreds of thousands of people who are just fans of Jesus. They may not even realize it. They may say, oh, no, no, I'm a follower of Jesus. But truly, the way they live is they're fans. They cheer in, uh, in, in packed out former arenas. They throw money at toothy false prophets and preachers, hoping that they will receive healing for their unhappy circumstances and live their best life now. I might be implying something here. But there's plenty Outside of just those groups who are, who are filling even our churches here. They, they see a, a, a temporary need in their present life that can be fulfilled. Some, they might be going through de- depression. How can, I, how can God help me with that? Maybe I need to go to church and I can hear some good preaching and that will help me. They're, they're looking for healing in their temporary life, but they're not looking at what God has intended for their eternity. Their desire to follow is shallow and insincere. Tragically, few of them find eternal healing. And many of them find out that they didn't find what they wanted and they leave. Also, of course, the ones who are not disciples would be the scribes and Pharisees. They're those enemies. You know, despite Jesus' lack of desire to be a celebrity, he had fans, but he also had enemies. You know, celebrities often have enemies, and Jesus was no exception. He had very uh, powerful enemies, enemies who wished and were plotting to destroy him. And this is a little bit of a side note here, but I can't help but... Uh, talk about this idea of the unforgivable sin. We see there in verse 29, it says, He that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. You know, there's a lot of talk sometimes about the unforgivable sin. And people wonder, what is the unforgivable sin? Uh, some churches or, or, or theologies might tell you it's suicide or something like that. But here, we really kind of get a good picture of this, and I want to share it with you in case you're here this morning and, and are concerned about this for yourself. Uh, the scribes and Pharisees had, according to Jesus, committed the unforgivable sin. But let's think about what their relationship with him was like, how they had, how they had uh, acted towards him. First, the scribes and Pharisees blasphemed. They blasphemed the work of the Father. You know, the Father had ordained the prophet's and John the Baptist to come and usher in the, uh, the, the ministry of Jesus Christ. And what did they do with John the Baptist? Well, they allowed him to be arrested. They allowed him to be arrested and killed. Then what about the ministry of Jesus Christ? Listen, they blasphemed the work of Jesus Christ, of the very Son of God. They asked, they didn't just allow it, they asked the Romans to arrest him and to kill him. They arrested them themselves, turned, them, turned him over to the Romans, and then asked the Romans to kill him. And what did he say while he was on that cross? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know, even the blaspheming against the Father and against the Son, and against all that Jesus had come to do and did for them, 
not just for us. And we observed the Lord's Supper this morning and, and talked about the great benefit and blessing that it is to be saved and, and redeemed by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. But he, he did this for them too, not just for us. And he was willing, he was willing that they would be forgiven. He said, for, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And we see, uh, it says in verse 28, he said, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. He says, listen, even the worst of sins are going to be forgiven. And if you're here this morning and you're concerned about your sinful state before God, knowing that uh, sin equals eternal damnation in hell, that's what the word of God tells us. Here you got a message right here from Jesus Christ himself saying that whatever sin, no matter how bad and ugly your sin is, it's forgivable. And he's ready and willing. But then at Pentecost, the Holy Ghost came and demonstrated God's power, didn't he? He he demonstrated God's power in many convicting ways. And and then the scribes and Pharisees began, what did they do? Well, they began arresting the disciples and and ordering them to keep silent, to stop preaching about Jesus Christ. And then what did they do? They killed Stephen themselves. And then Stephen told them what their sin was in Acts chapter 7, verse 51. He said, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. Father, forgiveness offered. Son, forgiveness offered. Holy Ghost, they'd reached the end of the line. Now listen, people today cannot commit this unpardonable sin of resisting the Holy Ghost like the same way that the scribes and Pharisees did when Jesus was on earth. They only sin today when they reject the authority of God and the Savior that he sent to save them from their sin. That's the unpardonable sin, rejection of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is sent to work in us. I believe the Holy Spirit works to draw us and and sends people to us to minister to us and share with us the truth of the gospel. But if we reject him, Hey, listen, we never know when the end of the line is for us. That's between you and God. But let me tell you, if you are in this house or on this broadcast this morning and you've never trusted Christ, that's the unpardonable sin, resisting and rejecting the love of Christ. Trust him today. Anyway, I got off a little bit on there. The scribes and Pharisees are certainly outsiders. They're not disciples, and we have some contemporary examples of them. Uh, this is a continually growing category in our world of, of peoples. We have uh, critics of biblical authority, uh, critics of biblical origins or creation. They call themselves scientists, um, and there are a lot of wonderful scientists, by the way, who believe in creation and work to defend the biblical account of creation. We see uh, 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 critics of biblical morals. They call, they, they call themselves movie stars or, or talk show hosts or political figures or the so-called educational elite. And they have avid followers. And they're pouring into the internet and to all the information that we have available to us, constant resources that refute the authority of God's word. There's critics. And it's a growing category of people. You get on the internet for very long and read about some, read some of these comments. I, I found myself uh, looking at uh, Ken Ham and the Ken Ham and, and Bill Nye debate and saw some of the comments. And some of these people just hate the idea of biblical authority. Now they they don't they don't call it hate of biblical authority. They call it. Those people are idiots because they believe in a fairy tale. They're everywhere. Also, outsiders, not disciples, friends and family. Uh, You know, Jesus, I, I think these people were followers, but they weren't truly following him. They had good intentions. They had good motives for Jesus. But their purpose that they wanted to accomplish was wrong. They wanted to take him out of his ministry, take him out of this chaos that was taking place around him, and take him home. 
back to where things were normal, where he could settle down and be a, a carpenter and have a regular life. Uh, and I may be uh, uh, you know, drawing a little bit more from that than that's what's there, but I believe that's kind of what was taking place. They, his friends, his people wanted to take him home. They had the right motive, but the wrong purpose. Now, this is a dangerous place to be, and there's plenty of people in churches like this. Uh, and there's many, Ameri- many people in America who do and say things in Jesus' name with good motives. They want good things. They want, uh, they want things like uh, uh, for people to feel included. They want things like unity and, he- and healing. But the things they say and do have nothing to do with Jesus. We might call them liberal Christians. They they want everyone to feel included, safe, and in unity with anyone else. But the church is to be made up of people who represent Christ. And Christ had some very important moral standards for the church. And we can't compromise those things in the name of inclusion and unity. And we're to love people who, 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 who are sinners like we are, okay? They're sinners just like we are. We're to love them and, and care for them and share with them the truth and hope in Jesus Christ. But to compromise the membership of church hmm. or the opposite side of that, there's an opposite side to this. There's liberals and then there's, uh, you know, I, I have down here fundamentalists. Really, there's nobody more fundamentalist than God himself, Okay. Uh, so this is kind of a earthly fundamentalism, which has been twisted and, 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 uh, uh, and perverted into something that it shouldn't be. And the motive, of course, is to live holy lives, to keep themselves holy, and, uh, but their motive end, ends up being twisted and leads to self-righteousness and harm. Harm, pushing people out who need Jesus. I, I, I worked at a feed store for a number of years, and, and, uh, and I worked in the... One time I was a manager and we had a large garden center and there was a young lady from California. She'd lived and raised in California and, and, and she loved to garden. Brilliant young lady, very smart. And I tried to share with her the gospel and we got to talk. We were friends and, and, and she opened up to me and, and told me about when she was a teenager. She had a very troubled teenage years and she did a lot of things that young teenagers do and kind of got into some dark stuff and was dressing darkly and had lots of earrings and a couple of tattoos and things like that. And, and she got invited to go to a church and she was going to that church and those people told her, you can't be here with that tattoo. Let me tell you, that's doing something in the name of Jesus that has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. And because of that, she doesn't want anything to do with church. And she would listen to me and we talked and we had good conversations, but she, I, I felt like she was kind of like that a uh, fellow in the Bible who said, Almost thou persuadest me. Because of someone who had an idea of what they thought righteousness and holiness was supposed to look like. Following what they thought following Jesus was supposed to look like. They had good motives, maybe. But bad purposes. This third point this morning is that Mark reveals who are the true disciples. You know, Mark has, Mark has spent time in, in our previous text, uh, chapters 1 and chapters 2, helping to define what a true disciple looks like by, by the example we see in Jesus, the example we see in John the Baptist, and the example we see in the, uh, the apostles and the, and the followers that he calls. We see that they're living a life that is radically different from the world around them, a life of sacrifice. You remember the disciples, they... Uh, they were called from the shores to become fishers of men, and what did they do? They dropped their nets. They, they were willing to give up all they had known, all their earthly security, and they were willing to live a life of suffering under the power of the Holy Spirit. They live a life that is faithful to the mission of Christ and pleasing to the Father, even in the face of tests and trials of their faith, even in the face of this idea of sacrifice and suffering and radical change. And they are also living a life obediently, faithfully following Christ who has called them out of the world and commissioned them solely for his 
purposes. But Jesus here then, in this last few verses of this, of this chapter, he defines this for himself, what a disciple is. And we see it in these last few verses. We see you know, his, his mother and his brethren, his brothers came, his people, they came to get him and, and take him. And he said, uh, and he answered unto them saying, verse 33, who is my mother and my brethren? And he looked around about them, which sat with him and said, behold, my mother and my brethren. And verse 35, he nails it down. He says, for whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. Now he wasn't saying that, he had contempt for his parents or for his mother or for his brothers. What he was saying is, is those who understood his purpose and were willing to live and follow him regardless of the chaos, regardless of the radical change, regardless of the sacrifice, regardless of the suffering, those who were willing to boldly persist in following Jesus Christ, those were his true disciples. It says, the one who is willing, uh, the one who is doing the will of God. He is my disciple. Jesus, he's boiled it down to one identifying facet that encompasses all these things that Mark has revealed to us to this point. That whosoever will, will do the will of God, that's who is the true disciple. That's who's on the inside of Jesus' plan. That's who's on the inside of accomplishing Jesus' will to bring about the kingdom of God here on earth. In other words, the person who's ready to forsake all for the kingdom of God. That's the disciple. That's his family. Well, what is the will of God? <laughs> well, that's a big question, isn't it? We often find ourselves asking, what is the will of God? We often ask that question wondering what it means for our own personal story, our own personal narrative, our own life. What is the will of God for my life? I remember being a teenager, about 19, 20 years old, and asking that question. What exactly does God want me to do? Does he want me to go to East Texas Baptist University? Does he want me to stay here in, Te in Tarrant County and go to Tarrant County College? I remember asking those questions. I went to church camp and asked Tom Bragdon, Tom, what am I supposed to do? What is God's will for my life? And you know what God's word tells us? It tells us what God's will is. It tells us in, in Matthew chapter 28, those who truly want to follow Christ, this is what he says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the earth. God's will is the great commission that the gospel is to be preached in every corner of this earth. Let me tell you, God's will is a lot bigger than your personal narrative and your personal story. It's much bigger than that. And, and I believe he does have a, a specific will for each of us, but he reveals that to us in his time. And until then, what are we to do? Preach the word. <laughs> and I don't mean just stand up in a pulpit. This is a very formal way of preaching, standing in the pulpit and, and having a, you know, three pages of prepared notes and printed on cardstock and in right colors so I identify where I'm supposed to be and all. no. We're supposed to share the gospel, preach the gospel in our daily life, live it out before those who are lost in our life. Like I said at the beginning of this sermon, much of the work of, of, of the kingdom of God is done outside of these walls. Let me tell you, Northwest Baptist Church is a, y'all are a wonderful church. <laughs> I love this church. I have fallen in love with you and fallen in love with, with what God is doing here. There are, so, there are some of the most faithful people I have ever known in my life right here in this building right now and some hopefully listening online. Some of the most dedicated servants. Wonderful. Let me tell you, this church cannot stand on the shoulders of the few. This church cannot stand on the shoulders of ministry that takes place within the boundaries of this property. 
We have to reach those that Christ, that God puts in our path. We have to be willing to follow him. Not just uh, following that mo- our model, the earthly model of ministry, of religion, in these walls, at the synagogue. Check the box, went to church today, going home. Watch the game. No. It's a daily sacrifice. Not keeping our eyes down on our careers, on our education necessarily, on, on all these things that are good things. And, and I'm not saying to forsake all of that stuff. What I'm saying is, is keep your eyes on Jesus Christ and follow him where he leads you. And as you go through your education, as you go through your career, as you go through your relationships, seek Christ in all of them. Live a life willing to sacrifice and suffer so that we might serve others. For what reason? (laughs) How about for the glory of God? How about for the kingdom of God? (coughs) Excuse me. What can we conclude from this, this morning? Be a disciple. This is what we're called to do. Be a disciple. Do the will of God. Listen, if you're here this morning and you're a believer, there is no more, there is no life more satisfying than when you're living in the will of God. I've tried both ways, and I can speak from experience. Living out of the will of God stinks. <laughs> it just does. It stinks. I've been miserable, feeling like my day-to-day life is futile. It's worthless. This, I'm wasting my time. I'm not gaining any ground. And when I do gain ground, it really doesn't give me the kind of peace and joy that I'm looking for, that we crave as humans, that, that we can only receive by being in the will of God and doing his will. I have not, uh, you know, I, I, from a, for a, a guy from Bedford, from Bedford, Texas, and I wish some of y'all would go to Bedford and spend just a week there to see how white bread Bedford is, okay? I mean, it's pretty cush, easy living, all right? Not a lot of danger in Bedford, Texas. But for a guy from Bedford, uh, I, I haven't sacrificed much in my life, but I have sacrificed for the Lord. I gave up a career. My wife and I, when we moved to Texas City, neither one of us, when we decided we were moving to Texas City to follow the call of Jesus Christ for me to be the associate pastor at Temple Baptist Church, we both quit our jobs and didn't have a job lined up. That sounds nuts. I remember my boss pulled me into his office at AT AT&T. He said, are you sure you want to do this? I mean, I know you like church and all that, and you're a Sunday school teacher, and that's cool, but man, you have a good job, and you have a good career. Your wife's a teacher. Did she get a teaching job? No. What are y'all going to do? Follow the Lord. Let me tell you, (laughs) just the right time, God gave Melissa a job. I remember uh, Melissa had to go ahead before I got there. I moved on August 16th, 2014. And I remember Melissa had to go ahead because school started and she had, you know, the, the, she had to start and listen and, and start with uh, classes before the students got there. Teachers have to do that. And, and so she had to go ahead of me about a week. And so I was stuck with Ben and John. Ben was like two and John was not even that. And I had to load up the rest of our house into a big truck. And I remember that Saturday morning, driving with that truck full of all of our belongings, the biggest U-Haul I could find, packed in there, and I was alone. My parents had my, brother, my sons, and, and my brother was going ahead to help us, but I was in the truck alone, and I remember thinking, this is nuts. <laughs> I'm... I'm leaving everything that I know, my family, and, 
and a good career, and, and I was scared. <laughs> it, was a test, it was a test, a trial of my faith. And I tried to listen to my regular radio station that I like to listen to and in town there, a sports radio station, and it wasn't doing anything for me. So I turned it to the Christian station, and guess what song was playing? My Grace is Enough. Let me tell you, it gave me such peace. Peace that I've been searching for for months. Peace that I'd, I I remember sitting in my truck at AT&T behind that back alley and just miserable, weeping, because I wasn't doing what God wanted me to do. That's another story, and I can't tell it all here, but such peace and not for any earthly security reasons, but because I had eternal security in what Christ was doing with my life. Let me tell you, be a disciple. Be bold. Be ready to persist against difficult times and follow him. There is no more satisfying place than to be in the will of God. We look for fulfillment in all of those. We look for it in money and in pleasure and in entertainment, but it never, ever satisfies. Not only is it, is it satisfying, though, in this life, <laughs> with the rewards of peace and joy, but there are eternal rewards that are innumerable that I can't begin to talk about here today. If we read much of the Gospels, especially the Gospel of Mark, it's easy to see that Jesus' ministry reveals his identity. It, what he did reveals who he is, who he was. And this should be a guide for our life as his followers. What does our life reveal about our identity as true disciples? You know, your life should reveal that you're a true follower, and if it doesn't, you need to get it into submission to him or to our church. Northwest Baptist Church, let's ask this question. Does the, does the ministry of Northwest Baptist Church reveal who Jesus is? Oh, let's pray that we push towards that mark, that we're glorifying him and serving him and accomplishing the mission in all we do. But maybe you're here this morning and you're not a believer or you're listening today. We talked about the unpardonable sin or the unforgivable sin. And it exists. But it's the only sin, the only sin it is, is rejecting Jesus Christ. Are you in danger of hardening your hearts against Him, against the calling of Christ to trust Him? All you need to do is trust in Christ. Repent, and He will save you. Let's stand together. I was able to listen last week to the service while driving from Fort Worth to Waco and good sermon we heard. But Lester talked about the invitation and I wish we had uh, had a little more talk about that before this morning. But let me tell you, if there's, we don't have a pianist right now, and, but there's a time here for you to react to what God is doing in your heart. There's a time for this. It's important that we take time for this. Don't leave today without submitting to him in what he's calling you to do. You may need to pray where you're standing. You may turn and kneel. It's okay. And pray uh, where, where you're sitting. I'll even be okay if y'all can keep your distance to come up here, this front row or up here. I want to ask you to come. We'll close our eyes. And we're going to sing Just As I Am. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou biddest me come to thee, O Lamb, of God I come, I come 
Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, help that to be our prayer this morning. That as you call to us, as you speak to us out of your word, and I pray that this sermon has been used by you. I pray that it's been clear and straight to the point, Lord, identifying what it is to be a disciple. At the heart of what it is, is to be someone who's following you. God, I pray you help us to observe our own life. Help us to see whether or not it reveals Jesus Christ. (laughs) And Lord, if it doesn't, and many times it doesn't, we're not perfect. Lord, help us to continue to persist, to press ourselves, to submit ourselves to you. We might serve you. Lord, help us to take our eyes off of this world and the stuff of this world, the distractions. Lord, the devil has made a wonderful carnival of distractions for us. God, help us to devote ourselves to the one thing you've called us to be and do, and that is people who are, who are serving and following you faithfully, fulfilling the Great Commission. Lord, I pray if there's one who's listened to this message today and they haven't ever received Christ, they have questions, I pray that they'll be bold and they'll be, well, at least be willing to ask questions. Lord, to either me or Brother Lester or Brother Nathan or whoever else might be here that they could talk to, they might seek an answer and they might receive you as Christ, their Savior. But I pray for our church. I pray for the cold weather we're going to experience and and the dangers that's going to impose. I pray for safety. Lord, we praise you for your love. We praise you for a good worship today. We love you. And God, help us to trust you more. In Christ's name, amen. Well, thank you so much for being here this morning. It is, I went a little bit over, but that's okay, because, you know, y'all don't have to be back at 2 o'clock. Uh, but y'all be safe, okay? And um, y'all are dismissed. I'm going to be I'm going to be right here. Nathan, can you be? Where is Nathan? All right. Nathan, can you be back there at that back door? And we're going to say goodbye. Bless you. Have a good afternoon. And y'all be safe going home.